was it great to see y'all? Yeah. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming out. Um, so we have a wonderful program and uh, just, uh, just really excited about it. And so thank you everybody for coming out on this Sunday afternoon. It turned out to be a, a lovely, brisk day uh, after yesterday yeah. and the other night. Um, so just real quick, I'm George McDaniel. I'm the Director of Youth and Media here at Church of the Good Shepherd. And I'm going to introduce our special guest speaker today, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, so our speaker is Dr. Will McCorkle. Uh, he is a former social studies teacher in Greenville and in Costa Rica, and is currently a professor of education at the College of Charleston, uh, and he also, where he specializes in uh, immigration, and uh, particularly setting education with his asylum seekers at the border. Um, and he also serves on the board of Practice Mercy. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Will McCorkle. Okay, well, I'm going to take this off if that's okay. I'll keep the, the six feet. Um, but uh, thank you all for having me today. And I want to thank uh, Beth inviting me out. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. And uh, Beth actually had a chance to go with me down to the detention center um, in Georgia. This is back in pre-COVID. Yeah, pre-COVID. It was like two weeks before the world shut down. <laughs> Um, but uh, we've been talking about doing something here at the church, and so uh, I was able to have a conversation with George, um, and we've been doing quite a few of these events um, throughout South Carolina, uh, both in Charleston and in Greenville. Actually, Alma, the lady I work with at the border, um, who's the president of Practice Mercy, was here last week, so we had a couple of events. And really what the purpose is, is to inform the American public and especially the American church about what's actually happening at the border um, and hoping that people get engaged and really speak out for human rights um, at the southern border. And so I want to talk to you all a little bit today um, and feel free to interrupt and uh, if you have any questions, I would definitely want to be a conversation so I won't just try to, I could go on about this for like two hours, but um, I want to try to limit my time at the beginning here so we got time for questions, either for those um, here in the room or if there's anyone on the live stream that has any questions. Because I know it, it is complicated and things at the border are shifting like every week. Um, so as I say, there's not really anyone who's an expert on this topic because it's always evolving. And so it is complicated, so don't feel um, strange for asking a question of clarification because it is hard to understand. In some ways, I think it's done on purpose that way, right? That it's sometimes it's so complicated that um, it's easier to kind of keep these um, unjust structures in place. Um, but I wanted to start off with looking at why this is important um, for you all and the youth ministry, um, for those in the church, like why the church should care about immigration. Um, and so that's why entitled this The Border and the Call of Jesus um, in Beth Hira. So maybe there's a question here before we I get into the presentation. Anyone have any thoughts on what Christianity says about um, immigration, what our stance towards immigrants should be? To love your neighbor. Okay, so mm -hmm. going back to the basic of loving your neighbor, um, and I think it's Interesting. Actually, I actually was going to get to this point right when um, the person asked Jesus, "Who's my neighbor?" They give he gives the story of the Good Samaritan, where it's the one who's the outsider who is actually the hero of the story. And so it's when you're saying love your neighbor, it's not just your literal neighbor, but those who are even outside of um, the categories of the inside group. And so. The very essential idea of loving your neighbor relates to this. Um, any other thoughts or ideas about how um, Christianity relates to this idea of immigration? We're all children of God. Okay, good. So this idea of us all being children of God um, and that shared vision of humanity um, should influence the way that we see people that are 
trying to flee oftentimes with their lives. Um, and if you look at the scriptures, and I, George, I'm sure gets become this a lot as well, that it's really just throughout the scriptures, this idea of people migrating and this stance towards those who are outside. Um, and so it's really hard in Christianity, at least from my perspective, right, to just divorce that from the way that we see immigration. Um, and this is one thing I have written about actually from, in, in the social studies context, but how, when we're talking about studying religion, how do we look at Christianity in regard to immigration? Um, so I, that's a, actually a resource I can uh, send to the youth group too if y'all want to look at that in more depth. But uh, it's different faith traditions might speak briefly about immigration, but Christianity, I think it's so explicit that to take an anti-immigrant stance is really not being faithful to the Christian faith. Um, that's all. Sorry. Um, so just a couple verses here. Um, they come from the Old Testament. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So this is seen throughout the Hebrew scriptures. This idea of doing right, doing justice for the foreigner, for the immigrant, as the children of Israel were immigrants in, or foreigners in Egypt. Um, another verse: Long ago, though I gave these commands to my people, you must see that justice is done, and must show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners who live among you, or anyone else. In you. Um, and so, when you see this call and care for the orphans and widows, the foreigner is also included in that. And sometimes, at least, in the U.S. church, probably it's not as controversial to say we need to care for widows and orphans. Now, actually practicing that sometimes is different, but that's not usually as controversial. When you start saying, and the foreigner in your land, sometimes people put their guard up a little bit. But those groups of people really go together. Um, and then this verse from Hebrews 13, 2, I think it's really interesting. Remember to welcome strangers in your homes. There were some who did that and welcomed angels without knowing it. Um, and that's going to go to the next slide here. And there's a couple other ones that I um, wanted to point out. Of course, in the scriptures, Jesus being the child refugee, um, with Mary and Joseph going to Egypt, fleeing Herod. And the image of not just Jesus saying that you should care for the refugee, but actually being embodied in the refugee. Um, the Good Samaritan, as we referenced before, another example that I was thinking of was the faith of the Roman centurion, who Jesus purposely points to someone outside of the um, Jewish tradition to say that this person had some of the greatest faith in the land, which... Um, if you read the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Luke, there's that constant theme of Jesus pressing up against the nationalism of the people, um, up to the point that they would try to throw him off the cliff because he's daring to insult um, kind of this ethnocentrism and this nationalism. Um, but also the Great Commission going into all the worlds, the idea of making disciples in all the world. And then I didn't put this one on here, but I think in Matthew 25, when it says, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me, right? You welcome the foreigner, you welcome me. Um, so it's, again, throughout the, the Christian scriptures, and so I think the way that we're talking about immigration is not just something that's peripheral to the Christian faith, but it's really essential to it. Um, sometimes we treat it as something that like, nah, that's just a controversial issue, like there's different opinions on it, where I think if we actually go back to the scriptures, it's harder to take that kind of non-committal stance. And so I did want to get into a little bit, not to give a big history lesson here tonight, but I did want to get just a little bit of this background in 20 minutes of our immigration policy, where we're at today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about this as we um, at the end of the session here. But if you look at our asylum and immigration policies in U.S. history, what a lot of people don't realize is that we largely had open borders until the 1920s. Um, 
So we think of, does anyone know where this is at right here? Ellis yeah, Island, okay. Um, oh yes, yeah, Ellis <laughs> yeah, Island. Um, but uh, there were times in Ellis Island where over 99% of people got in. So you did have to go through this process and this screening, but most people just got on a boat, got to the US, and if you weren't like extremely visibly sick or they didn't think you were involved in some type of organized crime, they let you in. And even if you did get rejected, it wasn't too difficult to get in. Um, and this wasn't just the case in Ellis Island. This was also the case, and this is like an old picture from the southern border, where the southern border was largely just open. And actually, there was very, very few restrictions for people from Latin America because the Southwest was dependent on this labor from Latin America. So most of the time, you could just not even get, there wouldn't even be a border agent there. You just kind of come back and forth across the border. It was very open. Um, anyone know the first group of people that were actually stopped at the southern border? The first group of like undocumented immigrants? It was actually um, the Chinese. So then in the 1800s, um, late 1800s, the U.S. passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, which says we don't want any more Chinese immigrants coming into the nation. And so they said the first people to come in illegally through the southern border were not actually Mexicans. Because Mexicans were allowed to um, come into the United States. It was Chinese immigrants that were being excluded by the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so they said so that what happened sometimes is that Chinese immigrants would try to learn a few words of Spanish, like put on some Mexican clothing and see if they could just walk by and keep their head down. And hopefully there would be no border guard um, that would stop them. And so starting in the late 1800s, really based on this racial fear, you start seeing these restric restrictions on immigrants. So it starts with the Chinese immigrants, and then they start restricting other groups from Asia. And then in the 1920s is where they really put these large-scale restrictions on immigration, saying that there's only a certain quota that's allowed from every country. And it was a quota system that really favored those from Western Europe and so it's more about, okay, we'll let some more Irish and German and French immigrants in, but we don't want Asian immigrants. We don't want people from Eastern Europe. And, you know, the 1920s is, um, you know, historically this time there's a lot of, and that's when the KKK rises again. There's a lot of um, this rising white supremacy and that immigration restriction was now what happens in the 1960s is that, um, does anyone know who signed the Immigration Act, 1965? LBJ. LBJ, yes. So, um, and this was kind of part of this larger civil rights movement. So that there was an expansion, uh, the US kind of went in a more inclusive direction in the 1960s. They did away with the blatant racial, racial quota system that had been established in the 1920s. However, in order to make it more fair for every country, one thing that did happen was they said, immigration from Latin America now is gonna have the same regulations. Because even in the 1920s, when they put all these restrictions on Asia and Europe, people from Latin America were still largely allowed to immigrate because they were so dependent on labor from Latin America. So it didn't apply to the Western Hemisphere. But in the 1960s, they said, okay, we're gonna be more fair. We're not gonna make it as blatantly racist system, but in order to do that, we're going to say that immigration is also limited from places like Mexico. And so what ends up happening is they um, you start getting a lot more people entering illegally from Mexico because there have always been this people going back and forth, but now that was illegal for a lot of people to do. Um, How did the whole Mexico system get set up? Because there's like so many different right now, right. currently, like people I work with, people who work for my company, usually a lot of them are here on a certain type of visa, but there's other ones, there's, a, I don't know, at least a handful or more than that of different types of visa for different types of workers. Did that come out of, did that kind of generate out of the restrictions that 
So the 60s is where that was a lot of that was really uh, codified. And so it became largely, um, especially family visas, right? So if you're married to someone, they're going to have access to a visa, extended family after so many years. And then they do open up more visas for certain careers. Yeah. What ends up happening over time is that they start marginalizing visas for people that are working class. Even though there's this huge demand for workers, um, you know, if you have a, if you're a doctor, if you're an engineer, you might be able to get a visa. But if you're um, working in a low-wage industry, like you're not going to have access to that. And so it does become a lot more selective over time. Um, where historically, like Ellis Island, it tended to be like the poorest people who were immigrating. Over time, it's kind of shifted to be like, we'll take the most educated and wealthiest immigrants, but the poor immigrants, we're still gonna employ them because our economy is dependent on that, but you're not gonna be able to leave with their visa. You're gonna have to kind of do it under the table. Yeah, because the numbers seem to just kind of morph, right. you know, it, depending on what, you know, what the current top ticket the news item is, right. you know based on the numbers of this type of visa and that type of visa and things like that. So I know that people that I work with, and I have a close friend who's Canadian who's worked for like 15 years in the United States, and it was just even for her, it was just this frustrating arcane process, even for her right. <laughs> as, a tech, as, a, as a technology uh, you know, um, worker with a company who was sponsoring her you know, to get her green card, it was just insane trying to navigate the system. Right. So, yeah, yeah it's, and that is a good point. I mean, it's complicated, even for people that do have a, maybe a more privileged uh, background or like that education, even oftentimes in that case, it can be this long process. Oh, yeah. But then if you add on top of that, the lack of financial resources and the language barrier and a more difficult visa process because you don't have a company sponsoring you, it becomes really complicated. Um, and so, and the immigration system really since, you say largely from the 1960s, there's not been much congressional movement. And so it's largely the president deciding what these changes are going to be. Um, kind of related to that is the idea of asylum. So people getting to the shores of the United States saying that I'm being persecuted, I don't feel safe in the country I live in, and I'm asking for asylum. Now, the U.S. policy on asylum has kind of ebbed and flowed, depending on oftentimes the group that's asking for asylum. Um, where do you, you can't see that here, but uh, what country are these people coming from? Cuba, Cuba right? So um, really up until the last decade, if people from Cuba could actually get to U.S. soil, they were often able to easily get asylum. Um, and usually they were able to easily get through that system largely because the U.S. and Cuba have, um, you know, historically there's not a good relationship there. And so for political reasons, the U.S. has been more likely to accept asylum seekers or refugees from Cuba. However, um, this is from the 1980s, from El Salvador, um, when the US government was supporting the government of El Salvador, even though it was a military dictatorship, when people were fleeing from there, the US would not actually consider them asylum seekers, because they would say, if you're fleeing from the government we support, you must be a communist, or you must be a revolutionary, and so it's not a legitimate asylum. And this is where a lot of churches, and also including churches um, in the Episcopal Church, became these sanctuary congregations. And they said that we're going to actually house people that are seeking asylum, even if the U.S. government says that they're not um, legally allowed to get asylum. And in some extreme cases, they actually, like, this couldn't happen today because of the power of the cartel, but they would actually, like, help people cross illegally into the United States. Like they were humanitarian coyotes, you can almost say. Um, now, if they did try that today, the cartel would just you know, kill them. 
Um, but there was a Presbyterian church in Tucson that kind of started this. It was called Southside Presbyterian. It was a movement that began across the United States to say we should accept people from asylum for asylum even in countries that the U.S. government doesn't see as legitimate. Um, and so, depending on where we're talking about in our history, our asylum policy has differed. Um, one of the most tragic examples, of course, was what our policy was towards asylum seekers and refugees in World War II, um, where there became this resistance to accepting Jewish refugees. And of course, we know this was part of the issue with Anne Frank's parents not being able to get asylum in the United States. And so usually when you talk about that historically, and you're like, you ask people, should the U.S. have accepted Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Europe? People are like, of course, they should have done that. But then when you talk about it in the present, oftentimes we don't see it in the same light. Uh, but what I would argue is a lot of times it is, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, and so when people were seeking asylum, and I was going to fast forward here to under Obama, Trump, and now under Biden, um, most people that have been seeking asylum, does anyone know what countries they're coming from? There's three main countries that people have been fleeing that come to the southern border. Honduras. Okay, Honduras. Guatemala. Guatemala. Colombia. Some from Venezuela. Yeah, the tribe. Colombia. Nicaragua. Some from Nicaragua. Um, maybe a few from Colombia. Not as many recently. That was definitely more like in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and El Salvador. So like, they call the Northern Triangle. So El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras is where the majority of people. You do get some people from Nicaragua and increasingly from places like Venezuela that will actually come up through Mexico to, to uh, seek asylum. So most of the people that have been seeking asylum are not actually Mexican citizens. Um, and actually, you're not allowed, unless in case, um, except for some extreme cases, you're not allowed to seek asylum from Mexico. Um, so most of the people you've heard being at the border seeking asylum are from those three nations, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, and if you look at what's going on right now, they have some of the highest murder rates yeah, and so and a lot of it, that's been and that's very recent um, in the last year. You get more Haitian asylum seekers, um, and actually the camp that I work at on the southern border, we've seen some more Haitians in the last couple of months. Um, so usually, what would happen under the Obama administration was if you came in, you were seeking asylum. Let's say you were a family. Um, or if you were a mother with a child, a lot of times you'd be allowed to stay in the U.S. until your asylum claim was heard. And so they would put these like ankle bracelets on people so they could track them where they were at and that they wouldn't miss their um, court appointment or court date. But for the most part, they were allowed, at least women and children were allowed to stay in the U.S. until they had now, if you were a single male, you would usually go to the detention center. And a lot of times, you would stay in the detention center for a while, and then you'd be deported. So Beth and I actually went down and saw this. This was the detention center in South Georgia, um, down near Columbus, Georgia. And I still remember the first time I went down there, I, saw, I met with this young man from El Salvador. He was 18 years old. And he had crossed over with his brother, who was 16. Because his brother was a minor, they let his brother go live with his father. They like released the brother. But because he was 18, he was in this prison. And I remember he was crying and said, as bad as it is in here, I don't want to be in prison. It's better than going back to El Salvador because I'm going to be killed by the gangs. And he was very involved in his local church. He was trying to flee the gang violence. They were going to force him to join this gang. And um, so that was kind of the situation under Obama. It was... For women and children, there was more opportunities. A lot of times, single males would still be detained 
So what happens under Trump, of course, he comes in with a much more aggressive policy towards immigration. Um, and one of the things that he does, and I'm sure you all remember this in 2018, was saying, we're going to do a child separation policy. And so to try to deter people from entering the border, once they cross, we're going to separate them from their children. Um, and this was a picture, this actually wasn't from the Trump administration, this was taken a couple years earlier, but this kind of became the image that was associated with the child separation policy. Um, and it was such an egregious act against human rights that you know, the UN gets involved and they issue a statement. Um, I remember there was hundreds of people marching, I was living in Greenville at the time. So you know, a fairly conservative area of the United States and there was a couple hundred people out marching against the child separation policy. And it was one of the very few times that the Trump administration actually took a little step back and reverse course. Now there was nuance to that and there were some um, people that were still being separated, but that they moved away from that being their primary policy because it got so much public feedback. And it was an election year in 2018. I think they had some advisors, advisors around the like, this doesn't look good. Like, you know, we know that you want to be harsh on immigration, but separating parents from their children, um, you might have pushed a little bit too far for the American public. Uh, and then he came out and said, no, it's Obama's fault that I did this. And, you know, there was, <laughs> there was some excuses for why it happened. Um, and so I do point to that because I think if the American public actually got on board and became active in these issues, it could change policy very quickly. Like this happened, this change in policy happened within a month. And they got so much public pushback that they're like, okay, we have to reverse this. Um, if there would have been the public pushback, they would have been fine doing that through the end of the administration. Um, but what often happens is, and this is what um, is the hard thing about politics and policy in general, is that a lot of times one bad policy is replaced by another. So there's like this um, immediate victory of like, yes, we ended the child separation policy, but the Trump administration said, okay, what we're going to do then is try to keep families detained for a longer period of time. And so because we can't separate the families anymore, we're just going to keep them all detained together in prison. Um, and so this was back in around 2019. You saw a lot of pictures of kids in cages. I remember Mike Pence went to one of the um, detention centers, and it was all over the news. Um, and this also got a lot of public pushback. Uh, I was living in Charleston at the time, and there was an event down at um, Riverfront Park. Again, a couple hundred people, this group called Lights for Liberty. I don't know if anyone was there. Uh, but it was like, we need to make sure that kids are not in cages. We need to end this family detention. And largely during this time, the administration shifts course again. Um, to a policy that was very politically strategic and smart, but I would say from a human rights perspective was actually worse than the family detention. And that was this idea of remain in Mexico. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there it is. Um, and so this got a lot less public um, attention, and it got a lot less pushback. And what they said is, instead of separating families, instead of putting families in detention, how about if we just say, we're not gonna allow these asylum seekers to come into the US at all. They can stay in Mexico. And they, and they had this very Orwellian name called the Migration Protection Protocol, um, which didn't do anything to protect migrants. Um, the more popular name was remain in Mexico, in saying that migrants have to stay in Mexico and the Mexican government's gonna to agree to keep them safe and sheltered in exchange, um, and over time they can have their actual court date in the United States. But they had set up this kind of kangaroo court on the border, so even if you got a court date, it was almost like an immediate denial. And Mexico um, never, cared for the majority of these migrants. As you can see, what it really turned into is people sleeping 
And so this is not even like a refugee camp you might think of in a place like Jordan or Lebanon. There's not a UN presence there really. It's just this makeshift um, asylum camp with people sleeping in tents on the ground. So this is, in the background there is the US border. So this is just feet away from the US border. So this starts happening in 2019 and all of a sudden hundreds and eventually thousands of people are just camped out on the border between Mexico and the United States. Because the US has now said, we're not gonna let people seek us out at all. Um, but good to go sell things. Um, these were some of the pictures of the first time I went down there. Um, and this was people bathing, washing their clothes in the Rio Grande. Um, this is another picture on the right of what the asylum camp looked like. And uh, as you can see there, the river, at least this part of the river is not that wide. And so you, you hear about the danger of the river and there's some places where it is wider and it would you know, flood. But at least right here, it's not very difficult physically to get across. Anyone know what the danger is? Okay, so border agents can um, catch you on the other side. That's, that's one of the fears. And what's an even greater fear that I have? Who, who controls the river? I guess. <laughs> the cartel. So they say in order to, it's like they, they see themselves as the owner of the river. In order to cross, you have to pay $500 a head. Will, for some of the... Younger folks, uh, the cartel. Can we just give a real brief little yeah. snippet? Yeah. So the cartel is like the you know the mafia of uh, Mexico and Central America. So they, um, it's this organized crime where they they threaten individuals in the government. Um, they are the ones who control the drug trade as well, and they largely control the migration trade. You could say as we've made it more restrictive for people to migrate legally. The cartels are the people that they pay to cross. And so they're the people they have to pay to get through Mexico and even to be able to cross, to be given permission to cross, they have to pay the cartel. And if they don't pay them, they can be killed. Um, and so it's this really strange irony when the U.S. shuts down its borders and says you can't legally see asylum, it's strengthening the cartels even more because it's just adding to their business and giving them more power there. Um, next. Um, so this is where, when I first started going down there, this is where I was at, in, it's called Matamoros. It's right south of Brownsville, Texas. Um, and that was where that first camp arose. Um, so you can see that it's right down near the Gulf of Mexico. And one thing I forgot to mention, so you, you have this Remain in Mexico policy in 2019, but then it gets even more strict when COVID happens. So they put in this thing called the Title 42 policy, saying that we're gonna completely shut down the border to non-US citizens and residents because of COVID. And so now you're not even, under Remain in Mexico, you could at least have your name put on a list and like, hypothetically be given a court date. But now they're saying, no, we're just gonna deport you and we're not even gonna like, put your name on the list. Like The border's closed. And that has remained in effect even while now, if you're a tourist, you have a tourist visa, you're allowed to come in. So the only people that have COVID, I guess, are asylum seekers. So it's, and it's really, um, to use health measures like that for reasons that are not really about health, creates a lot of skepticism among a lot of people. Because at this point, it's not really being used to stop COVID. Um, it's nothing about COVID. It's just a way to keep the immigration restrictions in place and saying, we're doing this because of health concerns. And so that added even more to these restrictions that were already there beforehand. Um, I did want to show you this image. This is actually, it's a sad story, but it ended up being a really beautiful story in the end. So I worked with this organization called Practice Mercy, um, and it's a Christian nonprofit there, 
Rio Grande Valley. So we go in to work with asylum seekers, we pray with them, we uh, bring in supplies, we try to advocate these things like this to let people know what's going on. And one of the ladies who became kind of one of the leaders in the camp, um, and I'm writing a book about her life right now. Um, she um, She's from El Salvador, and she was, um, you know, the one that was being the encouragement for a lot of people in the camp. But at one point, she was so scared for her kids in the camp that she paid cartel members to send them across. And a lot of the parents did this. And this is like a very, um, you know, a deeply religious person, a person that hates everything the cartel stands for. But it's this situation when you're in between a rock and a hard place. And do I pay? It's going to be safe for my children to cross with the cartel and be picked up by border agents than to stay in this camp on the other side. Because as you can imagine, the camp, there's no security. And so um, the cartel members are just running loose there in the camp. And so how dangerous this is for everyone, especially for children. And so these were her two young girls that they paid the cartel to get to take them across. They could see it happening, the Border Patrol agents getting them on the other side. Um, now, this, this doesn't often happen. In this case, it actually was a really beautiful ending because they were um, allowed to be released to their uncle in Boston, and then their mom was eventually allowed to be reunited with them. And they actually came down, and uh, this past summer, they were in Charleston. Like we, had them come down and do an event, and they like stayed at our house, and so that was, and again, that's kind of an exception to what usually happens, um, but it's kind of showing the desperation that a lot of parents would go through. They're like, I'm willing to be separated from my young child so that they can get out of this situation. Um, this was a young man from Guatemala that was one of the people that was killed by the cartel for not paying to cross the river. And the Mexican officials, the cartel in some ways has more power than the actual government officials. And so they said it was a drowning. We don't, we don't know what happened. He died in the river somehow. Those inside the camp were like, no, he was killed because the cartel um, wanted to prove a point or they wanted to make a lesson of it. Um, and so that's kind of what we're talking about, the, the danger that's there. So the fact that the U.S. government is saying you're going to stay in Mexico um, in the midst of this cartel violence is really putting them in this horrific situation. Um, these were some of the other children there in the camp. And there was a kind of sense of on one hand, it was horrific. On the other hand, there was this kind of sense of community that was built up because they were there for months in the camp. And um, these were just some of the kids playing marbles there um, in Muslim walls. <coughs> this is a lady I work with, Alma, and we'd be bringing in these supplies for the women and children there in the camp. It could be things like shoes, it could be things like underwear, just things that people would need in the camp, and we would bring them in. Um, oftentimes we have to go in at dark, uh, at night, after some of the guards left to bring in these supplies to help out the people that were inside the camp. Here's just another view of the, this tent city, and you can see the U.S. border there right in the back. Okay, so um, that was the Trump administration, and I remember a lot of people we worked with in the camp were like, we're going to just try to cross illegally. They've been waiting for like, some of them over a year. They're like, it's too long, we're not going to get across it. We kind of tried to give some advice saying like, just wait to the presidential election because there might be this shift that occurs. So this was like in October of 2020. Um, and Biden had promised that he was going to make these reforms. So we're like, we don't want to like give false hope or make any guarantees, but there is a chance there could be some reform here. And there was some at the beginning. So as you can see these headlines here, um, 
the people that were in the initial camp in Matamoros were allowed to enter the United States. And so the original camp we worked in, they were allowed to come in, and most of them are going through their asylum case right now. <coughs> Sorry, I'll put my mask on over here. I brought it's not COVID, it's just scary. <laughs> <laughs> Get a long drive. <coughs> um, back to the next slide here. <clears throat> so what happens though is the, the first camp is closed down under Biden. So he officially ends the Remain in Mexico policy. But he kept the Title 42 policy in place. So these COVID restrictions. So what ends up happening is right next door to Matamoros, or like an hour away, there's a city called Reynosa. It's actually a more dangerous city than Matamoros was. And so about a month after they closed down the original camp, the second camp starts being formed again. It was this really like sad sense of deja vu. It's like, this is happening all again. And this situation was actually worse. Because at least in Matamoros, the first city, there was a lot of space. And so kids had places to play. Um, it wasn't ideal by any means. But compared to this, it seemed a lot better. Because this is basically like a city block. So not much bigger than you know, the city block here in downtown Somerville. Um, and you see more and more people start just congregating there in Reynosa. And this was back in like May. Um, so you start seeing more, more people bringing in tents um, and just waiting there, hoping that the U.S. is going to change their asylum policy. There's a couple more. You see people just hanging out their clothes there. This is in some churches would bring food for the migrants, but it was um, very haphazard. So, like, if you didn't, if they ran out of food, you weren't in line. Someone tried to get food twice. Like, there's no guarantee of actually getting food. Um, and so, you can imagine sanitation is a huge issue. Um, just food security is a big issue. And I think the biggest thing that the parents worry about is the actual physical security. One of the things that stuck out to me the most was that mothers stopped talking about how they can only get a couple hours of sleep a day because they're so worried to like fall asleep because they don't know what's going to happen to their children when they're asleep. Um, and so there's this constant insecurity and just this mental and emotional toll that it's putting on families. Um, it's another picture. I think there's like, a couple of videos. Oh, videos. Oh. In my whole George, it should be on the slide. If it's not, I can, I can share with y'all too. Sometimes the videos work on Google Slides, and sometimes they don't. Is that one of the videos? It should be, but maybe see the next one that was. I just want to show you this real quick before. This was, I went down there in December and there was this Christmas tree. And there was this kind of like sad, ironic photo, right? This Christmas tree right there um, in the camp. Um, I think the next one is one of the videos. Fine. I can send it to uh, George and send it to you later on. Sometimes the. Yeah. Put it on Google Slides so that it doesn't work. Oh, it's, it's the oh, same format. Oh, it's in some button. I need access. I don't know what that. Oh, yeah. Maybe I didn't like uh, put it right. So I can sure. send that to y'all later on. It's just a couple of videos of what it looks like there in the camp. Um, another thing I wanted to just hit on briefly before um, we open it up for any questions here. Is one thing the US government has done is not only put so much security on our southern border. So sometimes you might hear 
people talk about we need more border security. And sometimes I'll even hear people say things like, we have open borders. And I'm always like, you haven't been to the border if you think you have open borders because it's extremely militarized. Um, just to give you an example, one of the young men that we worked with, he's tried to cross 16 times. He's never been able to successfully get into the United States. Now you can get onto the actual land, but the first hundred miles is like this buffer zone, and to get past that is extremely difficult. Um, so there's not only this huge security apparatus on the southern border, there's also this idea of the US government using Mexico and Central America as their border agents. And so the people coming up from Guatemala into Mexico, the Mexican immigration being in a lot of ways employed by the US government to carry out this immigration enforcement. And if you ask a lot of the migrants there, they're like, the US immigration is um, here, but they'd rather deal with the US immigration than the Mexican immigration. Like they can be so cruel to the Central American migrants. Now the kind of silver lining of this is that they are corrupt. And so you usually can like pay them off so you can like get through. Uh, so that's like a, a good and bad thing. Um, but in a lot of ways, the US government is saying, to not even have the eyesore of what's going on at the southern border, let's just get Mexico to do our work for us. Uh, and that's what I was talking to a uh, friend who was working down there at the border, and she said sometimes people would mock Trump that he never actually built his border wall, and she's like, but in a lot of ways he did. She said the border wall is not the physical border wall, it's the Mexican government that the U.S. is using to carry out that role. And even now, this is happening under the Biden administration. Um, recently, this is in the last couple of months, um, they never did Title 42, but also the Remain in Mexico policy is now back in place. So the Supreme Court said they didn't end it in Loretta Lynch. And so the U.S. is telling Mexico, you're going to have to keep all these migrants. And I was, asked, I was actually at a meeting with the mayor of Reynosa, I was down there in December, and I was asking him, like, why does Mexico agree to do this? Like, it seems like they're just getting bullied by the United States. And he said the way that it's, it's done is the U.S. tells the Mexican government, we're actually going to make your companies abide by these trade policies if you don't agree to this Remain in Mexico policy. So they're, like, threatening the wealthy in Mexican society that we're going to, like, put these restrictions on you if you don't agree to like house these migrants, which usually just means a lot of them are just sitting on the streets. And this amazing thing, where I was with some nonprofits, we were having this discussion with the mayor of Reynosa about who's going to pay for the septic tank in the um, asylum camp. And it's like, why, between, he's like, you know, the nonprofits need to pay for this. It's like, why are we having this discussion between a local mayor? And these nonprofits and these huge governments of Mexico and the United States are not doing their job. Um, and so, what I think has really happened, especially in the last year, there's been a lot of negative pushback and coverage about immigration. There's been this narrative that there's these open borders. And so, the Biden administration started making some more inclusive policy for asylum seekers, but they largely reverted back to what it was under the Trump administration. And if you ask most people on the ground, there's not much difference at all. There's a nicer tone to it. Um, I had a cartoon, I, I should have watched on this one, but it was basically uh, Biden telling the Statue of Liberty, like it was like um, closed borders and you know, you're not welcome, he's like, but say it in a nicer tone. Right? So it's kind of the same policies, but just not as explicit. And in some ways, that's more dangerous because when it's so blatantly anti-immigrant, sometimes it gets the American public on notice. Right? People are angry, they're talking about it, they're in the streets. When you use nice language and nice tone, but really continue with the same policies, it's actually a lot more insidious because it's just a lot. Um, 
One last thing I wanted to end with here is that um, let's say you go through this whole process and you're actually allowed to come into the U.S. and seek asylum. That's kind of just the first part. You actually have your court date, and if you're denied asylum, you can just be deported right back to where you came from. So you go through this huge process going through Central America, through Mexico, and um, then you can just be deported once you got here. And so this graph is a little bit hard to read here, but this is the percentage of cases that are denied based on the city. So there's the red line. So you can see there Atlanta, about 95% of cases are denied. So if you're an asylum seeker living in the South, you can go through this whole process of being able to be let in, but because of the political ideology of the judges, most of the time you're just going to be denied. You see the difference in a place like, let's say, New York, where the denial rate is only about 30%. So it's not really about the, the primary issue is not the legitimacy of the case, it's about the ideology of the judge. Um, and so that's a whole other issue, right? So even we talk about people just being allowed to go through their asylum process, but in a lot of cases, especially here in the South, the whole system is very much stacked up against individuals. And so um, we've had some of these conversations with friends who are trying to decide where they're going to go in the United States. And most of them have family here. So they'll be like, I've got family in North Carolina, and I've got family in New Jersey. And you're like, North Carolina is probably going to be nicer weather, and it's probably going to be cheaper, but your actual immigration case, it's a lot better for you to be in New Jersey. And so, that's kind of another issue once people, if they are allowed to enter at all. Um, so I know it's a lot of information, um, and I hope it wasn't too much, but uh, I would love to have any questions that y'all have, um, any points of clarification about what's going on, um, about changes that have occurred over the last couple of years, ways to get involved, anything like that. Yeah, well, so my question is that is going to be a little personal towards towards you. So there's, um, I'm sure if you know Brian Stevenson uh, and the Equal Justice Initiative and such, and his book Just Mercy, and he talks about uh, proximity learning, where he, he goes down and is uh, works with death row inmates, and and his his ideas about those things shift by being in close proximity right. to it. So could you speak a little bit about how perhaps your ideas have shifted from going from studying it from afar and then actually going down and being close up and see, seeing it firsthand? Right, that is a really good question. And I think this is one of the reasons we encourage people to actually come down to the border with us because it's, it does shift that perspective a lot. Um, there's so much going on in the world and it's like you can hear about something, you can watch a documentary, and a lot of times, a couple days later, like we moved on to the next subject just because there's like so much stuff going on. Where when there's that real personal connection, it's a lot harder to just kind of leave to the side. Um, I think one thing for me, seeing it um, as a parent, it uh, it makes me realize how much I would do if that was my child in that situation, right? So there's a uh, we can have like kind of these abstract ideas about what should be the migration policy, you know, should people enter illegally, and you're like, no, if this was my child, I would do whatever to make sure that their life was safe, that they would, you know, actually have this opportunity in life. Um, and so seeing that, um, I think, moves it from these kind of like abstract ideas about immigration. A lot of times, people can become so distant just about these numbers versus these numbers, and you're like, no, these are individuals, these are real stories. And you know, also I would say just the amount of faith I've seen among the migrants. Um, that even in these like horrific circumstances that they kept their faith and they've actually like in a lot of ways are an example to the church in the United States who by and large have it so much easier and it's easier to like move away from that 
you see that a lot in the camp um, with these individuals, um, really believing that God's going to deliver them from this situation. Oh, um, there in the news cycles over the past like year, year and a half, there there was engagement um, by the Biden administration with the Ukrainian countries where these migrants are coming from. And I know that's happened cyclical. But do you see what's your opinion of, of the latest efforts and whether there is kind of a solution that could be brokered between the governments of these countries to address some of the reasons at least for why this is happening at the source versus dealing with it, you know, you've got you got the source and then you've got you know, man trying to get across the border. Whereas I'm sure that if there was any way to mitigate what the circumstances were at their home, they would have done it. Right. So, but I didn't know if, it, if you'd seen any differences with what you know Vice President um, Harris has attempted to do um, versus other efforts in the past, whether there's any hope for that, you know, that you see a reasonable hope for any kind of change versus what's been perpetuated over the years? That's a really good question. Is there is this larger discussion about how do we stop the, there's always been people migrating with like this need or like this um, massive migration. Um, and I do think there's some things that could happen like over time. It's going to take, I think, unfortunately sometimes, sometimes the U.S. is like, we're going to do this now to stop migration you know, next month, it is be something that will set the seed now and then 20 years, maybe we'll have a different society. And it's not just anyone, like everyone just wants to come to the US, because you don't see people from Panama or Costa Rica, um, and even recently, not from Nicaragua, in the last couple of years, we've seen a little bit more coming to the US. It's mainly from these three countries where there's just this, the countries are in a mess. Um, and actually, the lady that I work with at the border, um, Sandra, the lady I'm writing the book about, um, she, this is probably the one thing that she agreed with Trump on, was like when he cut off aid to some of these countries about, um, in regard to immigration, because she was saying that there's so much corruption that when you're giving money to the government of El Salvador and Guatemala, like it's not, it's not getting to the people that actually need to, um, are getting migrating. It ends up just, in some ways, strengthening the people that are causing the issues in the first place. And because the cartels and organized crime are so much interlinked, it could be this self-defeating thing where you're like giving aid to the government of El Salvador or Guatemala, and somehow it's like getting into the hands of the gangs and the cartels and actually like recreating that issue. So I think aid is important, but it has to be you know, we have to be very intentional about how it's used because otherwise they could actually make things worse. Um, and I think another issue, this is a whole other topic, um, but maybe re-examining the war on drugs as well because that's one of the big factors that's caused these countries to just go into turmoil was that, you know, back in the 1980s, most of the drugs from to the U.S. were coming through Miami, the Miami Vice, they shut down a lot of that, and so Central America and Mexico become where the drug routes go through, and it's destroyed those countries. Um, and so I think we I think we do need to talk about those like um, source issues, but some of it might be having these difficult conversations about things like the war on drugs, which I don't think anyone in either administration are like willing to actually. Yeah, it's about. too far down for right. them to really be able to work on it effectively with everything that's right. going on and to address it. And plus, I mean, besides what the current situation now, you've got impending climate immigration and refugees. It's just going to keep right. this issue is just going to it's not going to go away or stay the same. It's going to get bigger. It has already. Um, so I'm wondering, it'll, I mean, <laughs> and even in the United States, I mean, that's going to be a thing. 
um, as we move through the decades of this particular century. So um, I just have no clue how that's going to fold into the current situation that we have, you know, and how immigration and, and uh, refugees are handled because it's so impactful already. And it's just going to get bigger as other climate impacts change and people are moving just to be able to survive. Another reason why there are refugees and immigrants because they can't physically anymore live where they are to survive. So how is that going to fold into everything that's going on? And how are the global, how is the global community and the government going to react to it? Because seeing so much of it already is, you know, nope, stay away. So, well, I think this is a really important point that things are, migration is just going to continue to increase with um, climate change, while at the same time, wealthier nations are saying, we're going to put up our walls even higher. It's not just the U.S., it's Western Europe, it's places like in, in Chile, which was letting in Haitian asylum seekers, and then they like cut that off, which is one of the reasons most of these Haitian asylum seekers are not coming straight from Haiti, they're coming from places like Brazil and Chile. Um, and so I, I do think there has to be some kind of international discussion about these topics because it is going to um, continue to occur. And I think in the U.S. context in particular, it's a real hard argument for the U.S. to make that we can't handle any more immigrants. We have one of the lowest population densities. And actually, I would argue we're our societies that we in desperate need, not that, not that this should be the primary reason we're doing this, but if you look at our economy, our birth rates are going down, um, you see it now like a labor shortage, and there's, we talk about what are all these reasons for it, but some reason, like, immigration doesn't get brought in, like, yeah, we've, like, these restrictive immigration policies, it's really hard to take them uh, seriously, and then people complaining about having a labor shortage, and, like, well, there's thousands of people that will fill those positions, millions of people. Um, but I think part of it is we have to get away from seeing immigration as this negative thing. But that's the way it's often portrayed, right? It's like, how are we going to stop immigration um, when you're almost like, if our nation's going to survive and to continue to be prosperous, we have to continue to have more immigrants coming in. Right, people. Right. Especially as, like, yeah, the, the birth rate is, like, what, one point? to or a couple, it's, it's going down quite a bit. This is going to be a departure from that conversation because someone else has a question about this. Um, so for the youth, I guess um, something that's interesting to me is you might, a, a minor might get into the country but not receive full citizenship, right? And they can go to school and I always think about the young woman who went to the valedictorian and the Greenville River and then she wanted to go to nursing school can you talk to them about what happens with the, is it DACA? Is it even around anymore? Or Right, and so a lot of the, the DACA is still around, but it's not, new people coming in are not eligible for it. And so like none of the people on the border would be eligible for it. Um, but this was a situation where if children came into the country and they were undocumented, they would be given DACA status. They're called like dreamers. We all heard of that. Um, and Again, that policy still exists, but no like high school students now qualify for it because they've had to be before a certain time. Um, and for those people in South Carolina that are DACA recipients or dreamers, um, they have a lot of restrictions when they get into like higher education. Like you can't get in state tuition, you can't get licensed in areas like teaching or nursing. And so um, I've had some friends, I had a friend that actually had to move out west teach because she couldn't, she was actually able to get a degree somehow, but she couldn't stay in South Carolina to teach. Even though she was bilingual and she wanted to stay in the state because of those restrictions. And so um, even if people are able to get in, oftentimes the system is so backed up and so restricted that they have to be, oh, sorry, sorry, that's my, uh, hold on, vibrate. Um, they have to kind of live um, and work under the table. In order to survive. And so we end up creating this economy 
where we're dependent on this undocumented workforce. Because if it was just taken away, if we think we have a labor shortage now, like we'd be in serious crisis, but we don't want to actually provide a pathway for people to be able to relocate to the United States. And so it's this, this catch-22 where it's like, we're saying we need you to come work, but you're going to have to, you know, we're going to vilify you for being here, and we're going to um, not give you equal rights, but we also like really need your labor as well. What are ways for like younger people like us to get involved besides, I know like getting educated about the topic is like one of the most important things, but what comes after that to help with the situation? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is um, continuing to keep it on the forefront of the discussion, whether this is like in schools, whether this is on social media, whether this is on um, wherever, whatever circles you're in. Um, for some reason, immigration only really gets attention when, unfortunately, the way it's set up is you get someone like Trump who's very anti-immigrant, you get a lot of attention on immigration. Outside of that, it kind of just becomes, we don't really talk about it very often. Maybe occasionally a story will come up. Um, so I think that's part of it, is just continue to like put that in the center of discussion, continue to share those stories, let people know what's going on. Because I don't think most people even realize what's going on. It's out of sight, out of mind. It's a camp on the other side. Um, and there are organizations as well, you know, locally um, in the state to get involved. There's a group of dreamers. So if you were kind of interested in that aspect of um, how to support Dreamers within the state of South Carolina. Um, and so, and I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards as well about some initiatives. Um, as I was saying, Beth and I went down to the detention center. Um, and I would love to eventually take another group down there to kind of see. And that's obviously a little bit easier to do than going down to the border. Um, your parents might be more okay with that, but the, the border is a little bit more of a, a stretch, but uh, there's ways to. Or even getting involved here locally with some families that are on the other side of that. Um, and there's a group that um, actually Emily Abbott, I don't know if you know her from College Charleston, but uh, she works with a group of these families, and a lot of them have just recently migrated. And so there's, there's ways to kind of get engaged on that level. Maybe it's like tutoring students that have just come into the country or been here for a while and help with their uh, language skills. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get involved. But I think part of it's just that first part of educating yourself and kind of keeping up um, with some of these things that are going on. It is complicated, it's always changing, but uh, you know, continue to keep that in the center of conversation. Good question. Any, any other questions that you have? Of the past few presidents, whose immigration policies have been your favorite? Like the last, or the, the, first, the first month of Biden's policy. So, yeah, um, if I had, like, you know, in comparison, let's say Obama to Trump, I think Obama's policies were a lot more inclusive. So I think there's a, there's a danger on either side. On one hand, like, people are like, all the policies are exactly the same. You know, I know there were substantial differences between the ankle bracelets and child separation policy. The other danger is, like, sometimes there's this perception of, okay, a Democrat got into office, like, everything's fixed, like we don't have to worry about immigration anymore, anymore. everything's just kind of being, everyone's being let in. And so kind of keeping both of those in tension. On one hand, there are significant differences, but on the other hand, these structural issues often remain the same. Um, and I mean, I will make a little caveat. Now, I, I maybe fell into that trap, right? Saying that uh, Biden and Trump are exactly the same. There have been some positive changes under the Biden administration. Um, for example, if it is a child that comes by themselves, they're not automatically deported, which was often happening under the Trump administration. Um, and also, children, if a family comes in with a child under the age of six, a lot of times they are allowed to stay. Um, and that's not so much because of the US policy, it's because the Mexican state there said, we're not gonna accept deported children or six anymore from Central America. And so sometimes the US will deport them straight back to Honduras or Guatemala, but a lot of times they let them stay. Where I think if the Trump administration was in power, they would all be 
So there are some differences. Sometimes I might skip over those. There are some differences, but the larger structural issues are largely the same. Essential, you know, from years past, and now that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, immigration and, and, and status of being a citizen and that kind of thing. But at what point do do politicians or do they, <laughs> without public pressure, see from an economic standpoint uh, the need for a new immigration policy? I don't know. Yeah, and I think it's something that historically there wasn't such a big divide between the parties. I mean, the last time there was an amnesty bill, it was signed by Ronald Reagan. Uh, now there was like, you know, border security and everything attached to that as well. Um, but even under George W. Bush and McCain, right, there was this kind of more, this idea we needed immigration reform. Um, and there are some people, like economic voices, even like very conservative economic voices that are saying, we need to dramatically increase um, there was a speaker last semester at College of Charleston that came, and I, I went and heard him speak, and he was an interesting guy. He's from Texas Tech. He wrote a book called Socialism Sucks. Like, he's very, very right-leaning. He was on, on Fox News and everything. But he wrote a book basically saying we need to massively increase immigration. It's not just like, let's load a few more asylum seekers in. It's like, no, we need to basically open up our immigration system. And that's going to be the one way our economy is going. So I think there are a lot of economists, um, both on the right and the left, that are like, this system is not working. And it's not actually good for the United States either. Um, unfortunately, there's that political aspect. I think one of the things we'll have, we really have to deal with is that the economic, the, there, I think there are some legitimate economic fears, but a lot of that are these cultural or racial fears uh, that sometimes the people that are the most anti-immigrant, it's not their jobs really on the line, right? They're in rural, you know, Ohio or rural Iowa, and there's not many immigrants there, but there's like this fear, this culture that has said that immigrants are going to take over. Um, and so I think talking about those economic grievances maybe will help some people, but then it's also like getting down to that root of what's behind this length, are you really worried about losing your job or is there like something else that is behind this? Um, but I think part of, this, part of that is having that conversation, saying that the economists don't, by and large, don't agree that this restrictive immigration policy is good for our economy as a whole. Um, so hopefully there'll be something, but it's, unfortunately, it's that political football. And that's the reason why we keep talking about the administrations because there hasn't been much legislation that's been able to get through. So it's largely these kind of piecemeal things that change from one administration to the next. So, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Any other that? so if the economists are loud enough, then they, can they, do you think there'll be enough of a voice to get the, the legislation to listen? So, that, I mean, so there is some movement. I mean, is that what it's going to take? I guess it's all like, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be. I don't. I don't know if the economy. You know, I do work with an organization that kind of works trying to um, get some more center right legislators on board, mm -hmm. trying to get some businesses, especially in areas like um, the construction industry, the restaurant industry, that can like, we're in serious trouble. Like, we need more labor um and so i think there is some hope there might be like something temporary done or like allow more agricultural workers to come in for example um we're hoping there will be a push for some of this this next year where there is a democratic congress um but that window is kind of getting smaller and smaller 
And unfortunately, not to be too cynical, but sometimes immigration is talked more about during election season and it's not put on like as a, a top priority. Um, there's some, for example, for dreamers, I think there's more political will. And I think 90% of the country wants dreamers to have a pathway to citizenship. And we're having a hard time doing that even with 90% support. Um, when it comes to asylum seekers, of course, since a lot of times administrations don't want to spend the political capital to say, these people are not going to be able to vote. They're not going to be able to get political donations. We're going to do this because this is what our values are. Um, and that's hard for them to do unless, I think the big caveat is if the American public actually gets on board. And I think there, it could happen. You know, and a lot of these social movements, they arise kind of, you don't think they're going to arise and they, there's this, there's not a lot going on at that time in the public discourse. It's something that just kind of catches fire and before you know it, there's this whole movement that started. I'm thinking of like, you know, the Me Too movement was like a tweet, right? And all this, I mean, it had the background of Harvey Weinstein, right? But it was a tweet that happened and all of a sudden, like within two days, this movement had taken off. Obviously, you know about with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, um, and I'm hoping that there's something where a story comes out, something happens where the, the U.S. public is at the right, right time that they actually get on board. Um, and I think this is one thing I try to catch myself, because there is like so much going on, there's a lot of different issues um, to get engaged with, but also like, I think this goes especially to um, young people, right, like finding that issue that you're really passionate about and being consistent and continue to like work on that. Because it's so easy in the age of social media to be like, everyone has to have an opinion about everything, right? And it's like, oh, this issue came with this, um, this happened today, this happened tomorrow. But just consistently working on that passion that you have. And maybe it's fine what that is, um, but there's so much distraction that if we have people that are really dedicated and just continue to do that work, regardless of what's happening that day or that week, I think that's how we make that long-term change occur. Any questions you have about the ministry or about anything, the actual work we're doing there at the border? If you go to practicemercy.org, is the organization. Um, and uh, we actually are taking some trips down there um, with the Presbyterian Church here in the Low Country, um, we're planning to bring some of the actually one of the um, people that's at Somerville Presbyterian has gone down there with me, um, and so we're, we've been meeting with some different pastors. And so, if you're ever interested in actually going down or getting more engaged, I'd love to talk to you further. Um, and if you just want more resources as well, um, I'd be happy to discuss that with you as well. You have to. Yeah, we we're a little bit more cautious about the current situation than we were in Montevoros just because it's like so jam tight that it's like harder to do that without get, you know raising a big scene. But we we definitely um, still bring in supplies. It's kind of more we don't do it like a big drive. It's more these people need this and we give yeah, it to them. Like that locally. Right. But there's um, there's a lot of ways to, there's um, all the organization I work with does have an Amazon wish list of like things that they need, so you could donate that way as well. Yeah, one more place. From a safety standpoint, which I'll do sounds very risky. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to that? I mean, do you Is there, a, is, there a, is there a risk going down there as an American across the border um, with the cartel? Right. Um, yes and no. Like, it is like, I mean, if you look on the website, like Reynos is a category four, I mean, whatever the, mm -hmm. the you know, the, it's in the red probably. Um, with that being said, like US aid workers or nonprofit workers are not the target 
So I guess in theory there could be like some you'd be caught in a situation where they were targeting someone else. But as far as I know, there's not been any missionary or nonprofit worker, anyone that's been targeted or kidnapped or anything in the border because they don't want the U.S. They don't want the um, the hassle of what that would mean for the U.S. government, right? So like if Beth went down there and all of a sudden they kidnapped Beth, um, it would be a it would huge be bad scene. business. But yeah, the car. Yeah, it's not good for business. <laughs> not good for business. So they're very. Um, and some of them kind of see it's there's an irony. Some of them kind of see themselves as these Robin Hood figures, even though they're like kidnapping migrants. So I don't know how, how that like plays into the Robin Hood calculus, but um, there is for some of them there's a code of ethics that they're not going to like target a missionary. Um, so they're about making money as long as you're not like interfering with their drug trade. Um, there's um, they're not going to be targeting you. With that being said, obviously we don't take like youth groups down there. That's, you know, if we have taken some older teens that have like come with a parent, um, but there is some more safety concerns that, you know, we, we're talking about maybe bringing a college group down um, from Anderson up in you know, the upstate, um, which is still, you know, a little bit, um, I still gotta think through that a little bit, but we do make, we're a little bit more cautious. We do have smaller teams, so we don't, we're not bringing in 15, 20 people. Um, we usually have smaller groups, so it makes it a little bit more safe. So a safe experience would be going down to Georgia. I mean, we, we were able to talk to a detainee, each of the students, um, the LRI, um, and kind of hear their experience. And um, I think eye-opening for our students, right? But in a safe, really safe environment. Right, that would be um, a really good way as well. Um, I haven't been down there since COVID. I think they've opened it back up. Mm -hmm. But also, I think be a great thing here locally just to kind of partner with some of the individuals and organizations that have come up, I mean, individuals that have come up here um, to South Carolina, maybe hear that experience. Um, and so if anyone's interested in that, there's a, this is in CCSD in you know, Charleston County Schools, but I'm friends with a person who's like the um, parent involvement coordinator for um, bilingual students. And she lived in Nicaragua. She's actually gonna come down the border with us. But she's like super engaged. Like it's her job, but you can also tell it's like that's her passion. Um, and so she's always trying to connect what's going on down the border to what's going on with families um, here in the Charleston area. Any other question? Anything else before we go? Thank you all so much for having me, um, and I'd be happy to continue this conversation with you all. Um, and again, if you look up um, practicemercy.org, that's the name of the organization I'm with. Um, I'll also um, send George the, I'm doing a talk on Tuesday night on Zoom. I'm kind of going in more depth just about some of the policies under the Biden administration. So if you're interested in that, or if you have a friend that wasn't able to make it that would like to hear, um, I'll be happy to send that to you all as well. So thank you all again for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.